Thank you for having me. I don't have much time with you, so I'm going to go through a lot of information. But I'll have points as well where I stop and give you opportunities to ask questions. More than anything, I'm here to give you a concrete example of how we developed our assessments at the University of Denver. But I'm also here to try to help you make connections across all of your different areas. So um, what we know about in higher ed is that there's definitely change um, coming to higher education. Just this week I had a conversation with our provost around how um, faculty really need to be more responsive to what it is that we need to do to prepare our students for the reality of the field. Right? And so it really is about that backward design. It really is about uh, looking at what is it that our students need to know and be able to do when they're in the field. And more than that is what impact do we want our students to have? Who do we want our students to impact? What difference do we want to make? And so really it's about that backward design and we're, I'm going to give you an exemplar about how in our program we, we really worked backward around what is our mission, what is our uh, institutional mission, what is our program mission, what is our own personal mission and vision as teacher educators or as educators, and then what is it that our students need to know and be able to do. And so I'll give you an example of that and really work back and we'll talk about this really exciting topic, assessments. You're so excited, I know that y'all wanted to sit up close, so I think it's, and that's really typical, right? I always, the faculty always do that, and I'm one of the worst, too. I always go to the, the, to the edges, just because it's, sometimes it feels a little safer, right? Um, so uh, just to let you know that it, I don't have a lot of opportunity to interact with you. I wish I had more time, so I really will be talking at you quite a bit. But I'll give you an opportunity to ask questions as well. So let's jump in, developing quality assessments. There's a, a technical component to developing quality assessments. But I, always, I will share with you some of those technical components. But it's really about what is the end that you have in mind. So there are a couple of, of things that I'll share with you that are more technical, but also broader around what are your big ideas? What are your essential questions? What do you want to accomplish? So today we'll be talking about aligning the assessments to standards. I know that you have standards. and. You have also um, accreditation across many of your programs using best practice to develop criteria and rubrics and those words that are even less exciting than assessment, reliability and validity, right? Um, so we'll talk about a lot of, uh, we'll talk about these components of developing quality assessments. Our key vocabulary, performance assessment, a product and behavior-based measurement that is based on a setting designed to emulate real-life context. Okay, what stands out to you there in that definition? Performance assessment. Anyone, yell it out. What stands out to you? What words? Real life. Real life. Anything else? Behavior-based. Anything else stand out to you in that definition? Applied. Um, our program at the University of Denver is teaching and learning sciences. It includes child, family, and school psychology. It includes curriculum and instruction and teacher education. Now, curriculum and instruction has a much harder time thinking about uh, what, is, what are the behaviors that our candidates need to engage in when they leave the field because it's so broad. And so often they start thinking about ideas. Okay, but uh, they don't necessarily get to the point of behaviors. And that's a place where we're trying to move around what are the skills that our students need versus what are the big ideas or the dispositions, which is also important. But we want to know what the skill base is that our students need. And so that's the performance assessment. I understand your, all of your programs have a clinical component. So here's the performance-based assessment part is what are they doing in the field? What are, what are the skills they need to enact? And how do you assess those skills? Our child, family, and school psychology program does have an evaluation component when the students go out into the classrooms, but then they never evaluate the students. They put them in a clinical setting, but no one is going in and actually observing them and actually rating them in terms of their performance. And so they're moving in that direction as well. We also have embedded signature assessments. These are campus-specific assessments that are chosen from the standard criteria, and they're used to track a student's growth over time. What word stands out to you in the embedded signature assessment definition? What stands out to you? Over time. Anything else? Growth. 
They're also campus specific, right? And so these are things like portfolios, case studies that are typical in, in the higher education classroom. But I will show you how we link our embedded signature assessments to our performance assessments. So the embedded signature assessments should still be connected to what they need to know and be able to do in the field. They should not be disconnected. And also, uh, we'll be talking about relevant standards. For us in teacher education, that's CAPE, the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. Um, some of you are familiar with that. Some of you may not be familiar. Over time, they will accredit teacher education, principal prep, counseling psychology. So anything that, uh, sorry, child, family, and school psychology, over time, they will accredit anyone who has a clinical component in a school. But they're starting with teacher education. In TAS, the Interstate Teacher Assessment and Support Consortium, the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards, and then different, we all have different content standards to meet in different state standards. So the first thing we want to think about is aligning assessments to standards. Standards are not fun. Standards are really big. They're very abstract. If they can be really hard to get at. You know, have you ever had the experience where you read a standard and you stop and you say, what? Right? Well, it's just so big and so broad that you're not quite sure what they're getting at. And so we really need to unpack those standards and, and really examine how to implement them in our program. Uh, CAPE has a number of standards that we need to meet, the Council for the uh, uh, Accreditation of Educator Prep. The first standard is related to content and pedagogical knowledge. We all have that, every single one of our programs. Clinical partnerships and practice, my understanding is you all have a clinical component as well. Um, candidate quality, recruitment and selectivity, so that would be admissions. Program impact, we're not really good in higher ed at looking at program impact. CAPE is moving us toward examining program impact, and so they're really moving us away from inputs to outputs. In the past, people would be uh, counseled to just give them everything you have. It's all about the input, so give them about 300 documents overwhelm them so they think that you're meeting every standard, right? So when the reviewers come in, they just get so overwhelmed and think you're doing so great because you have so many documents. There's no way they can get through all the documents, right? And so it was all about inputs. Give them every single assignment that your students have ever done. Give them meeting notes, every single um, record, every single meeting note you ever had. Give them every single email you ever had related to assessment. And now that's really shifting. CAPE is shifting us toward impact. How do our candidates impact students when they are in the field? Okay, so really they're focusing more and more on completers and focusing more and more on tracking data. That is really difficult in different states because we don't have access to, to the data that we need. In Colorado, for example, that's a big challenge. We don't even have access to teacher level data at this point. And so the state is pulling that together for us, and they were supposed to give it to us about a year ago. We still don't have it. So we really are looking more toward the output. What is the impact? So for you all in your different programs, it would be what is the impact of your completers once they get out into the field? How do you measure it? How do you track it over time? Um, also, we're looking at provider quality and continuous improvement. CAPE is really pushing us toward being honest about our strengths and weaknesses. So I think in the past it was more so check, check we met this standard, check we met that standard, we're really great. We're meeting all the standards. Now it's more about really being honest about what are the gaps in your programs and building plans to really remediate those gaps and improve those gaps and show growth over time. So the standards are really strong in that sense. They're moving us, in my opinion, the field in a positive direction. Today what I'll focus on is meeting the INTAS standards. I'll tell you more about the INTAS standards and show those to you. Again, that's the Interstate Teacher Assessment and Support Consortium. And also, I'll be focusing on applying that pedagogical content knowledge through assessments. Okay, so the outcome assessments that are performance-based. So I'm going to start first with INTAS. I was on the INTAS committee for about five years. I worked with people nationally with ETS, Pearson. We had teachers with us as well. We had state-level administrators. Um, we had people from different teachers' unions as well who helped support this work. And INTASC really was commissioned. It was started in 1992, the first standards, 
by the Council of Chief State School Officers, and they wanted to develop a common core. I know that's not a popular word anymore, but they wanted to develop commonalities or a common focus around what teachers should know and be able to do, their knowledge, dispositions, and skills. Now, this was not mandated across the state. It was developed really as a resource for states to use. And so uh, in 1992, they identified 10 principles, and this was supposed to help in the preparation, licensing, assessment, and professional development of teachers. Well, in 2011, they convened this new group. There are about 30 of us. And we really looked at what has changed since 1992. And so we looked at a new vision of, of supporting and evaluating teachers, and really looking at what has changed, what's the diversity, and how can we really increase the standard? How can we set high standards for students? And this is what we came up with. We came up with four categories, the learner and learning, content, instructional practice, and professional responsibility. And within that, we broke it up into standards. We started with the learner. We wanted to focus on students. And so that is inclusive of many different types. Of, that really is inclusive of child development. We then went to learning differences, so that really is inclusive of the diversity of our students, our student population in the nation. The learning environment was really about classroom management, setting up a respectful and productive, uh, and productive environment in the classroom. Then we went to content, 21st century skills and the application of the content, assessment, planning and instruction, instructional strategies, and then leadership and professional responsibilities. For CAPE, we have to meet the category level. We do not have to meet the standard level. And so just meeting the big buckets is what we need to meet in CAPE. Although I'll show you how in our program we meet all of the standards as well. The key themes in these standards were personalized learning for diverse learners, the application of knowledge and skills mainly through the concept of 21st century skills, assessment literacy, greater collaboration, more leadership, more focus on diversity across the standards, family, leadership, uh, more student-centered, a greater focus on technology and data. And so we amplified the standards. And then people started asking for the rubrics. So I worked on it with a smaller committee of about five people to build out the rubrics that we called the learning progressions. And so this really was a systematic approach to help teachers improve over time. And this is what the progressions look like. So the rubrics were created at three levels. When the standards changed, they were no longer intended for new teachers. They were intended for teachers across the continuum of their work. So in terms of your own context, it may be counseling. What does a beginning level counselor look like? What do they look like at a mid-level when they become increasingly sophisticated in the, the application of their skills? And what do they look like when they become expert? It might be the same for a principal. It might be the same for a curriculum developer. And so thinking about what the trajectory or the career, someone's career looks like over time, how, when they become increasingly sophisticated in their application of the skill, is how you can build out some of these rubrics. Um, this rubric is an additive approach. Um, this means that you see an increase in, in the skill when they become more advanced, when they become more sophisticated. Some rubrics are qualitative. So you can see a difference between each level. This one is additive. In the standards, we also had a section that was around development. So this idea, if you look at the top, the blue section is related to how do we get someone to move to the next level? So if we have a novice teacher, a novice principal, a novice counselor, how do we move them to the next level? If we, and then how do, what are the professional development opportunities? So on the bottom, you'll see ideas to develop them to the next level like completing assessments uh, with someone that really is a colleague in the building, working collaborative, co collaboratively with them to develop assessments, using specific techniques to develop assessments. And so it's, it's kind of like a library of resources to develop your teachers to move them to the next level. Uh, in the sense of your program, it may look like, what do the beginning skills look like when you're getting into the field? How do we move them to the next level? And I'll show you how we use this in our teacher prep program. We use this same idea. So first, we have to know the standards, right? That's the very first thing we have to know. We have to unpack our standards from each of our um, individual programs, and we have to understand them in depth. We have to take those big, broad ideas 
and we have to make them a reality. Then we have to be able to develop the criteria from our standards and also to develop rubrics. And there are some best practice that I've learned from working with CAPE. Um, I've presented quite a bit with the vice president of CAPE, Stevie Chepko, who is very focused on building quality assessment. So I've actually learned a lot from the process as well. Um, on the CAPE accreditation manual, you'll see criteria for evaluating assessments. Are the criteria standard based? Does the rubric or scoring guide define distinct levels of candidate performance? Does it measure what it's supposed to measure? Are the results consistent across raters and over time? So this is a good guide for any assessment that you create. And by the way, I'll make sure that you have access to the PowerPoint. Okay? Um, it's really important that you're using this criteria to assess any of your performance-based assessments. Okay? And actually, this, would, this is something that you can use even in your classroom-based assessments, but more so in a performance-based context. When you're looking to develop rubrics, there's also best practice around that. And this is identified also in the uh, CAPE accreditation manual. Are your rub is the criteria for your rubrics, the criteria and levels, appropriate, definable, observable, distinct, connected, purposeful, and complete? So as you're taking your standards, and I'm going to give you an example, okay, a concrete example. As you're taking your standards and developing criteria from your standards, and then starting to build out the rubrics, what you want to ask yourself is, are these criteria that we're developing, for, and for us, that we call them the dimensions, competencies, and indicators of equitable and effective teaching. And I'm going to show you what they look like. We ask ourselves, are they aligned to the standards? That would be our national standards. Okay, that would be the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards. That would be INTASC. That would also be our state standards. In terms of complexity, are they, cognitively develop, uh, are they cognitively demanding and are they challenging? Are they definable? Are they relevant and meaningful? Do they really assess what we're trying to assess? Are they observable? Can we see them in the classroom? Because this is a performance-based tool. Can we distinguish the levels of performance? Would it be clear what proficient, advanced, developing, and unsatisfactory is? Do they align across the levels? That means as you're looking across the levels, can you see the same theme across? It wouldn't be different around, are you, if you're assessing classroom management and you're talking about transitions, but you don't see the transitions in every level of the category. So there's an alignment across. Are they intentional? Do they focus on your mission and your vision? Is it clear what the exit proficiency is when they're ready to teach, when they're ready to be counselors, when they're ready to be curriculum developers, ready to be school leaders? Are they complete? When you look at your rubrics holistically, do they really get at the whole of the, what you're trying to accomplish? And again, that should link back to your standards. And it'll make more sense to you once you see an example. There's also best practice around um, looking at different levels of performance. So this is one of the things I've learned with working with CAPE is when you're building your rubrics across, don't define the lowest levels by the absence of a behavior. So we have an unsatisfactory category in our program. You should never say they fail too. Instead, you should say what they are doing. So unsatisfactory, instead of saying failing to show respect to students, what are they showing to students? They are, they are not connecting with students. They are aloof. They are distant from students. What does it look like? Or they are disrespectful. What does disrespectful look like? So we really try to get at unpacking what is it that it looks like versus what is it that they're not doing. That's really hard to do. I've gone over and over our rubrics multiple times, and I can catch places where I'm saying, well, they're just not doing it. And so you really have to push yourself to say, what are they doing? What does it look like? Do not use evaluative terms. This one's really hard, too. So instead of saying they develop a clear objective, well, what does a clear objective look like? For us, it would be it has the five components of a content and language objective. And so we really have to unpack instead of saying it's excellent, it's clear, it's adequate. Well, what does that mean? Okay, so you really want to steer clear of evaluative terms. Um, the stu my students are working on building rubrics now, the teacher ed students, and they're really struggling. They're trying to do all of this work, and rubrics are tough to write. 
um, avoid frequency counts. The students always want to jump to the frequency counts. But when I start to ask them, OK, let's say that you have a rubric and you say sometimes, always, never. Give me a number. What does no never mean? OK, never means zero. Always, well, OK, give me a number. What does always mean? And then when I try to get them to tell me the difference between sometimes and rarely, that's where they get stuck. So if you're using frequency count, you have to be able to then tally. And if you're not going to tally, then don't use frequency counts. Okay, so you want to steer clear of those two. And then use active, use active verbs. Okay? Make sure that they demonstrate action. So these, again, are tough to do. But I'm going to show you an example of how we've worked on these. Then you're being asked to establish reliability and validity, too. So right, you're being asked to take the standards, unpack them, develop criteria and elements, develop rubrics, and then you have to establish reliability and validity as well. So this is a, a process that's taken us quite a bit of time. So validity is the degree to which an assessment measures what it's supposed to measure. Okay, there's content validity. We have to establish content validity with CAPE. Do the criteria address all aspects of the content? Basically, are, is the content of the uh, rubric of your, of your framework, does it align with what you say that you are measuring? Do the criteria, do the indicators really get at your construct? In our case, we, we are focused on equitable and effective teaching. Are we really getting at the construct of equitable and effective teaching? Predictive validity is really hard to establish in terms of does it predict performance on another measure. We don't have this data yet. We will be working on predictive validity, and I'll tell you how we're doing that. Okay? To establish content validity, you can do things like bring in a panel of experts, survey them, collect that data, and, and see if they indicate that your measure is good quality and measures the content you say it should measure. For construct validity, you can compare your measure to another measure that's already been validated. And that, so that helps to develop construct validity as well. You also want to have reliability. To what degree does your assessment produce stable and consistent results? Over time, between raters. So when you, are, you have your raters in the field, your supervisors in the field, are they aligned? Could you send a supervisor in with any single one of your candidates and they come out with the same exact score? That's really difficult to do. It takes quite a bit of training and consistency over time. And so we're looking at the reliability and validity now of our tool, and I'll give you an example of that. So I'm going to tell you about our program and give you an example about how we've done all these, how we've used the standards, unpacked them, created rubrics, created observation tools, and how we're examining the reliability and validity of the tool as well. Do you have questions before I move on to the example? I think the example will help bring it to life. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the University of Denver, and then I'll go down to the program level, level. The University of Denver is a private institution. It was the first institution established in Colorado. And so I think they've been around since the late 1800s. Um, there are many, many different colleges, of course, in the school, including engineering and computer science. Uh, we have a law school that's nationally recognized, the business program, liberal arts programs, digital media. So we have many, many different um, uh, components to the university. We do not have a medical school. I would say that's about the only thing we're missing. Um, so the university has been in place for a long time. It is a private institution. Our tuition rivals Stanford. Most of our students are from out of state, surprisingly. And most of our students receive aid. We have a new chancellor, the first woman um, from in the history of our institution. And we're moving forward as an institution that is dedicated to the public good. That is our mission statement. Um, the Mortgage College of Education has been around about that long, and teacher education has been around since the, about the late 1800s as well. So we have many programs in our college like you. We have child, family, and school psychology, research methods and statistics, counseling psychology. We have principal preparation, teacher education, curriculum and instruction. We're all moving in the same direction around a greater focus on assessment. And for some faculty, that's a little more uncomfortable than for others and really starting to focus more on what do our students need to know and be able to do when they're in the field, how do we assess it, how do we get impact data. I would say teacher education is leading the field mainly because our standards, our accreditation board is forcing us to move in that direction. 
Um, sometimes teacher education isn't, isn't excited about that either. And so we're all moving in the same direction. Some of us a little faster, some of us a little slower. Um, but really it's moving toward impact, moving toward tracking our students and examining their impact in the field and preparing them for the reality of the field as well. Our teacher education program is a post back program. Um, we do also have a master's degree aligned with our program as well. Most of our, some of our students come in as dual degree students, so our students range in age, I would say, from about 20 to 65. So we've got a pretty broad range. We have a lot of career changers in the program as well. Um, that's increasing. Um, also, our diversity is increasing, and our male candidates are increasing. So that's been a positive that we've seen over time. Our program is what we call residency-like. If you're familiar with urban teacher residencies, I helped to design the very first urban teacher residency, one of the first ones in the country called the Better Teachers Program. And then I worked on the Denver Teacher Residency as well. So when I was learning about these residency programs, I brought their focus into our traditional program and made it residency-like. And this is basically the idea of a residency model like the medical model where teachers are practicing in the field alongside mentor teachers for an extended period of time. So we do have year-long placements. We put our students in one placement from the first day of school until the last day of school, nine, about 10 months, basically. They're in the schools, nine to 10 months. Um, they start two days a week in the field in summer. They go three days a week in the fall, three days a week in the winter, and then in the spring, they go four and five days a week. The reason that we do that is we want them to see the trajectory of a teacher and the reality of a teacher from the first day until the last. We also, this is a culturally responsive process. We want them to connect with their kids. We want them to build long-term relationships with the students so they can know their students and meet their needs. So we're putting them in a realistic setting. Um, in most teacher prep programs, what you'll see is, that, and I'll just tell you what my own experience observed for the first semester, and then the teacher left the room and left me alone. In a high school, I was 23, and I had some 20-year-old students. Imagine how that went. I think I blacked it out, because I don't remember anything about it. I swear to you, I don't remember anything about my student teaching. It was that bad. It was not a good experience, right? So many of our candidates are really being put in this situation where they're observing, and then it's the sink or swim. I'm sure it's not your candidates, but I have heard this across the nation, and it continues. For us, we pair them with a mentor teacher. We have partner schools that we use. All of our schools are 30% or more diversity. We want our students to see the reality of working with diverse candidates. Most of our students are placed in the Denver Public Schools. That's Majority of our candidates, we intentionally place them in high need schools. Um, and so they really do get that trajectory over time. We also have a gradual release of responsibility. We actually have a field work calendar that helps to guide them about what they should be doing at certain periods of time across the year. So our candidates really amazingly start teaching in September. They don't wait until the spring quarter to teach. I've actually started observing and evaluating candidates in September. So we have a gradual release where they're creating lesson plans using our template. We have a template aligned to backward design. And then they're able to start teaching by September, October. Some of our candidates have already taken over full class periods. The teacher teaches one section, they're teaching the next. And so they really work it out with their mentor teachers. Some of them go above and beyond what the fieldwork calendar states. But we want them all teaching lessons no later than October. So over time, I've even had candidates who've started taking over whole, whole days in November. So it really depends on the comfort level of the teacher. And just like everywhere else in the country, we try not to use the language of takeover. We, we say co-teaching, right? Becomes a, more of a co-teaching model. But the mentor teachers feel pretty comfortable leaving our students alone in the classroom. And we ask them to, so the kids will purposefully test them. And we all know, those of us who do teacher education that they do get tested, right? And so it really creates the opportunity for them to learn. The mentor teacher is observing them, giving them feedback. When we are observing, the mentor teacher leaves the room. But for the most part, at least during the first quarter, the mentor teacher doesn't leave the room. It's really more of a coaching capacity. They're in the classroom with the student as a coach. Um, we are a cohort model. We bring them through in cohorts. 
We have a rigorous screening process where they have to do a teaching event. They have to do a collaborative activity where they interact with others so we can see their social skills in that context and leadership as well. And we also align to district needs. So we look at DPS as an exemplar of a district that could be anywhere in the nation. A high diversity, high number of ELL students, new gentrification in the area. So we've got a lot of heterogeneity in the classroom, lots of extremes in terms of you know, high, highly advanced special education students as well. Um, so we really look at it as a microcosm of the rest of the nation and we align to the needs of the district. For example, we'll teach our students to write content and language objectives because that's what they do in DPS. And so we take some of the, we also teach the way they teach in DPS. So we model that for our students. We start with a do now. We have an objective for every class. We, form, we use formative assessments in every class. We use high engagement strategies in every class. We use exit tickets. We develop rubrics. And so we really are trying to model for them what it looks like to be a teacher in the K-12 environment. For those of you in counseling, it would be modeling some of those techniques as well. For those of you in curriculum development, it would be modeling um, the different components of curriculum development as well. So we really look to create rigor. We really look to create um, practice. Okay? Field-based components are really important in our program. So when we started looking at that redesigning our program, it was about seven years ago, and everything in our program has changed radically. Not one thing has remained the same. The reason it was our assessment. When we developed our performance assessment, we worked backward then, and that's what has driven the curriculum. So the performance assessment has become the glue for our admissions process, for our curriculum development, really has become what holds our program together. So we started with the end in mind. We set an objective. We developed performance assessments. We developed embedded signature assessments. And then we looked to establish the reliability and validity. So these are the steps that we took when we were looking at the transformation of our program and greater alignment to the needs of our students in the field. So we started with the end in mind with our programmatic and personal mission and vision. The mission at our College of Education and teacher education specifically is to provide an intensive, integrative, and transformational experience that supports the development of dispositions, knowledge, and skills for equitable and effective teaching. So our focus programmatically is around equitable and effective teaching. My argument is that you can't be effective if you're not equitable. And so we teach them how to do both. But we also went back and looked at our own personal uh, mission and vision. Why are we teacher educators? And this is an excerpt from one of my um, articles. In, it's called uh, Humanizing Pedagogy in the Review of Research and Ed. And this is why I got into education. I went to school with all my treasures, including my Spanish language, Mexican culture, familia, and ways of knowing. I abandoned my treasures at the classroom door in exchange for English and the U.S. culture. Consequently, my assimilation into U.S. society was agonizing. One of my earliest memories is of wishing away my dark skin. I wanted desperately to be white. I abhorred being la morena, the dark-skinned girl. I came to associate whiteness with success and brownness with failure. I was overwhelmed with feelings of shame over the most essential elements of my humanness. As a result, my experience in the U.S. educational system was marked by endless struggles to preserve my humanity. Think about what words stand out to you in that. Reread that one more time. What stands out to you? And turn to a partner and talk to them about what stands out to you in that experience. What words stand out to you there? What made an impact on you? 
agonizing. What else? Humanity. Yes. Okay. Assimilation. What else stands out to you? Abandon. Yeah, the, the contrast, right, what skin color brings and, and how I um, interpreted that. Uh, my parents came from Mexico. They're immigrants from Mexico. I was born in Mexico, but uh, they brought me to the U.S. when I was only two weeks old. I grew up in Denver. I've lived there my whole life. And um, so I, my, the community I lived in in Mexico was completely Mexican. It was really odd to see anyone who didn't look like you when you were growing up. So when I entered the school system, that was really my first interaction with U.S. society. I remember entering in the first in the kindergarten, and I had a bilingual teacher. Uh, he was of Mexican descent, and I remember loving school and really, um, really flourishing, right? Really learning quite a bit. And then I was mainstreamed in the first grade, and I can remember images of, of just feeling afraid. I remember the words that come to mind are cold, distant, afraid. Um, so it was the sink or swim, right? It was you either learned English or you didn't. There wasn't really any support. Uh, and what, one thing I remember clearly was being taken out of class in the first grade to have my English language assessed. And they would show me pictures, and I remember um, not knowing the word for egg beater in English, right? And so I would get a red mark for every word I didn't know in English. And that, in my, in my mind, in my first grade mind, told me there must be something wrong with Spanish. Okay? I, if I know the word in Spanish, I get it wrong. If, so I better learn English, right? But there's no value in me keeping Spanish because there, I get red marks, right? There's nothing good associated with this. Never seeing people like me reflected in the curriculum was very harmful. Assessment practices were very harmful. The message that my teachers gave me, even though it wasn't intentional, was that there was something wrong with my language. There was something wrong with my culture. People who look like me never accomplished anything, women or, uh, or people of Latino descent. And also the message that I got then was that there must be something wrong with my family then. And there must be something wrong with my language. And there must be something wrong with the color of my skin. And so I remember in this same article, I write about how um, in the third grade, I figured out how to be white. I figured it out. I, I could get into the highest reading group because all of the white students in my class were in the highest reading group. And so I had this theory that if I got into the Blue Robins, the highest reading group, that the color of my skin was going to change. And so I worked really hard to become a good reader. Hey, I, I love the bookmobile. My kids think I'm crazy and a total nerd because that was the best thing in my life, the bookmobile, right, when it would come into our neighborhoods. And so I, I worked really hard, and when my teacher called out my name that day for the, blue, uh, for the Blue Robins, I was so excited. I knew the color of my skin was going to change. And I kept looking and waiting and waiting, and I ran home, and I kept looking in the mirror. My mom thought I was crazy. She had a crush on a boy. She asked me what the heck was going on, and I wouldn't tell her. And I just thought, okay, maybe it's going to take time. You know, maybe it doesn't happen right away. But once I realized that the color of my skin wasn't going to change, I was just devastated. Like, I had to live in this dark skin forever. It's really hard to talk about because it's a really a personal experience, but I, I really want people to understand the impact. And so for most of my K-12 experience, it was pretty agonizing. I did everything I could to be successful, which meant distancing myself from my language, my culture, and my family. And it wasn't until I got to college that I was able to learn about my culture and my history and really the incredible strength of, of people who look like me in Mexico and Latin America, but also in the United States and all, and all of our contributions. And that really helped me then to feel connected to my language and culture and really embrace that element and see it as a strength and a resource and something that fuels who I am. So the way that I talk to my children, I have three children, 14, 11, and 10, is that we can't help but be great. We have math and science in our blood. We come from the Aztecs and the Mayans. Okay? So we can't help but be great. Greatness is in our blood. And that's a much different approach than what I had when I was in a K-12 education. So the reason that I became a teacher educator is because I don't want anyone's humanity stolen. I want our teacher candidates to understand that what they privilege in their curriculum, what they assess, Okay. What they value is very clear to their students and that their students are getting implicit and explicit messages about what matters. 
And so we are training them to be equitable and effective teachers. Effective teachers enact the strategies, research-based strategies that we know work. Equitable teachers affect culturally responsive teaching. They connect with their kids, they understand who their kids are, where they come from, and they draw on their resources to help them learn. They don't celebrate. I tell my students to take celebrate out of their vocabulary. We're beyond the fiestas at this point. It's about deeply embedding the student's culture, who they are in your instruction, and really knowing who your kids are, where they come from, what they value. So you use that as a resource for their... So it's not about... Um, another way that I teach my students is let your students and encourage your students to bring their maleta into the classroom. A maleta is a suitcase. Do not send them the message that they have to leave it outside of your classroom door. So it really is using their maleta, their suitcase, their treasures, their resources, and their instruction. Turn to a partner and tell them why you got into being an educator. Why, what fuels you? Why are you an educator? Go ahead and turn to a partner and do that now. Okay, para, let me get your attention. I think we could talk about this for the rest of our time together, right? Give me one word, anyone. One word. Why did you become an educator? One word. Just one word. Family. Family. Give me more. One word. Service. What else? Influence, inspire, to inspire. Why did you become an educator? Give me three more words, three more. On this side, change. This side, middle. Content, okay. this side. To develop, okay, great. So when we talk about assessment, it's important to start with your institutional mission, your programmatic mission, and your own personal mission, and, and find a connection between those. My understanding is that your institutional mission is to serve the underserved. Okay? Initially, when it was developed in Appalachia, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, there's a lot of different people that you have in the state now, right? Lots of diversity in the state. And it's, it's really about serving the diversity of all of the different areas in your state that you are able to make a difference and serve the underserved. So who are the underserved in your state? If that is your mission, then what does it mean to serve them? What is your programmatic vision, uh, mission? How do your programs serve the underserved? How does your own personal mission and vision relate to this? How can you find a place in this mission and vision? So the first thing you do when you develop an assessment is not to go to the standards. It's to go to your big ideas and say, what is the purpose of the assessment? Okay, what are we really trying to get at here? If our purpose is to create equitable and effective teachers, and that's something that I personally am invested in as well because of my own experience, then we set an objective, and our objective is that our candidates and completers will be equitable and effective teachers and facilitate the growth and development of all learners. But the way that we worked at getting at all learners was a little bit different. We created a performance assessment where we put the kids at the margins in the middle. We put the underserved in the middle of our performance assessment. So the very first thing we did is we said, who are the underserved in our state, in our community? The underserved are typically students of color, English language learners, special needs. Those are the high need areas in our district right now. English language learners, special needs, students of color. Uh, at times that's also, and there's a court direct correlation there to income as well, right? Low income. And so we really looked at who are the underserved, put them right in the center of our evaluation. Why do you think we did that? Ah. 
Excellent point. So universal design talks about teaching to the margins. And by doing so, you're able to teach to the middle. When we looked at using existing performance assessments, such as the Danielson framework, that wasn't something that we felt met the needs of the kids in our state because there was little to no focus on diversity and equity. And so what the Danielson framework does is it puts the, the students who are in the mainstream at the middle of instruction, thereby missing the students at the, at the margins. Okay? So what we did is we said, what is effective instruction for the students at the margins? And our performance assessments have a very big focus on English language learners, on cultural diversity and on special needs. And what we argue is that by doing so, we're preparing teachers for all kids. Because using sheltered instruction, for example, using strategies that meet the needs of English language learners, well, that's just good practice. That's things like visual supports, graphic organizers, and scaffolds. Okay, focusing on academic language, well, that's good practice for all kids. Okay, supporting special needs students is, is some of the same components of ELL. Scaffolding instruction, visual support kinesthetic movement as well, right? And so by including that in the middle, we're, we're helping all kids. By focusing on cultural diversity, we're increasing and enriching the experience of white students as well. Looking at multiple perspectives, looking at multicultural content. Okay? And so that was our argument, that we are going to place them in the middle. We are going to privilege the kids who are often considered underprivileged. And we are going to make them the target of our instruction. My argument is that if you have a diversity course, that is about compliance. It's a checkoff. If you assess for equity and diversity, that is what you value. Okay? So you have to put equity and diversity, or in your case, serving the underserved, at the center of your assessment. Because that is how you will hold people accountable for their behaviors in the field. You all know that your candidates can come out and spout whatever you want them to spout, right? The question is, can they enact it? By putting it at the center of your assessment framework, of your evaluation framework, they must enact it. They don't have a choice. And so this is something that shows what you value and you hold them accountable. So this is what we did. We developed a performance assessment. We call it the FEAT, the Framework for Equitable and Effective Teaching. And we say that our candidates will use their feet as a catalyst for change when they enter the school system. And that's our framework. We have four dimensions, engage, plan, teach, and lead, 20 competencies, and 66 indicators. So when we were creating this, we actually started with the standards. I was on the INTAS committee at the time, so I was using a parallel process as I was learning about INTAS and the rubrics. I was devising the performance assessment as well. So the very first thing we did is we went to the research base on effective teaching. We did a literature review on effective teaching, quality teaching, about 50 empirical articles. We pulled out the themes. We used qualitative research to examine what were the most common themes around effective teaching. Then we did a literature review for, uh, for equitable teaching, multicultural, cultural responsive, to make sure that we weren't losing that component because effective teaching is also equitable. And we brought in all of those components as well. The common themes we were able to find, we brought that into our dimensions, which are the simple engage, plan, teach, and lead. And then we built out the competencies, and then we built out the indicators. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Then we built the rubrics, and then we built the observation tools. Okay, so it came first with our, our institutional mission and vision, programmatic, personal, and then it went to, okay, now what, is it, what, do the, what does the research say? What do the standards say? And how do we package that in a way that our students can understand and it becomes a framework and the glue that we all have in common, a common language? So this, is, this shows you our first dimension, engage. So equitable and effective teachers engage students in an, effect, in an inclusive and supportive learning community. How do they do that? Through these three competencies. Establish respectful and productive relationships with students and families. Use equitable classroom management strategies. Engage students by making content engaging. So then it's the indicator level. Okay, so our students have to meet the competency level. 
but the indicators are evidence that they met the competency. So that's the body of evidence that shows that they met the competency. They don't have to meet every single indicator. They have to meet the competency to be proficient. So we built out first the, the dimensions, right? The big ideas, the big criteria. And then we went to the competency. What is the observable component? So this first one is really more abstract, right? This is really more like a standard. This is our standard criteria that's aligned to the research and the standards. And then we went to, but what is actionable? What is the behavior that we would see in the classroom? And then we unpacked it even more. But what would that behavior look like? What kinds of pieces of evidence would we see to unpack that, to be able to say this person is proficient at this competency? Okay, all of this is standards-based, it's research-based, and then we also tagged it. That's something that we need to do for CAPE accreditation. So each competency and each indicator is tagged to INTASC, the Interstate Teacher Assessment and Support Consortium Standards, to the Colorado Quality Teaching Standards, to the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards, and even more, what we did is we took some competencies from our state tool that helped us establish what college readiness looks like for students. With CAPE, we have to meet the criteria that we're preparing teachers to help students be college and career ready. There are no standards for college and career readiness, national standards. There are no state standards in our state for college and career readiness. So I had to go to the P12 standards and pull out the components that were college and career readiness. And so we tagged it to that as well. This is actually an example of content validity. This is how you can use, you can show CAPE that you have content validity by tagging to standards. We even have a document that tags to the research. Okay, so we have that level of detail and that's a way to show content validity. It's research based, it's standards based. Okay, so we're able to use this documentation. Okay? So big picture, step back, institutional mission and vision, programmatic mission, your own mission. The next thing is, well then what's the criteria? What do our students need to know and be able to do to serve the needs of the underserved? This is the criteria we establish. The dimensions, competencies, and indicators are the way we serve the needs of the underserved, are the way that we develop equitable and effective teaching. Once we had this, and this took years, by the way, years and years to do over time, right? And refinement. Every year we refine this tool. We don't leave it the same. Then we built out the rubrics. Okay? So all of the, the, competencies and the competencies that you saw are here at Proficient. So this includes all of our competencies. We started with the proficient level. You'll see word for word, they're the same as our competencies on the framework. Then we looked at what did it look like to be advanced. So this is what it looks like to be ready to teach. In your case, it might be ready to be a school counselor, ready to be a school teacher, ready to be a curriculum developer. What does it look like when they're ready to enter the field? Then what does it look like at an advanced category? What we're trying to do is help our candidates see what their future is. When they are in the field, what kinds of things will they need to do? To become an advanced teacher, they will need to be more student-centered. For those of you who work with novice teachers, you know that's really hard for them, especially at the beginning. They're so focused on themselves. And I'll give you an example of how they really focus on themselves. I was in a classroom, a second grade classroom, where a teacher was doing an engaging strategy with macaroni. She was having students uh, put macaroni into, uh, to, in the place of where an apostrophe would be. So she was doing the lesson first. She was going to move to the macaroni next. She had the students using whiteboards on the floor, the second graders. So the students were supposed to show their whiteboard to see if they got the correct answer. So as she was modeling and giving them examples on the whiteboard, um, they were supposed to be answering. Well, I, I watched the whole back row of Latino boys, five of them, when she said, did you get it right? Thumbs up if you got it right. Every single brown boy in the back row had their thumbs up and none of them had it right. Right? And they were showing her the board, but she was so focused on herself and her lesson, she didn't even notice. So she was using a formative assessment and completely ignoring it because she was so focused on getting through the lesson because I was in the room. She wanted to check off and make sure that she got through the lesson. 
So we know over time they become more advanced. They become more focused on their students, on their students' data, and use that to drive their instruction. So we want them to understand the trajectory. Most of our candidates will start at level two, developing. Either they don't have a lot of strengths yet, right? Most of them have not taught before. Their classroom management's pretty rough. They don't have a great understanding of assessment. And so they start in the developing category. We also have an unsatisfactory category because we use that to counsel or forcibly take students out of the program. So we have a category where if you are not doing well on the assessments, you're just not improving, or you're a detriment to children, we're able to use this category to get some data to help the field out a little and make sure that we're not putting people in the field who should not be teaching children. Or there are some of our candidates who realize over time that they really weren't meant to be K-12 teachers. We all know these candidates where they have a, a sense of this is something they want to do, but they have a very idealistic sense of what teaching is. And it may be a counselor, maybe a school leader, right? When they get through the program, they realize that it's not for them. And so this, actually, this unsatisfactory category helps us work with them and counsel them to figure out if this is really what, what is right for them. Okay, so we use this category quite a bit. So again, this is how we develop the rubrics. We started with our competencies and we work backward. What you'll see is an alignment. So wherever we talk about one thing, there is a, a consistency. Demonstrates value and respect for students' home culture. Demonstrates respects and interactions. Dismisses students' culture. Do you see how in this category we try not to do what they, we try not to say what they don't do. They model poor communication skills. They communicate negative beliefs about students' abilities. So instead of saying they don't respect students, we say what they do. We don't use any, any uh, frequency counts. We try to stay away from vague words, although that can be hard, because I'm already seeing examples of words that I need to go back and address, right? So rubrics are really an iterative process. It takes quite a bit of time to really get the language down. But if you're working on this in your own, if you have rubrics that you're developing already, really it's going back and assessing that. It's going back and assessing if you're using the, the best, um, best framework, if you're using the criteria for effective rubrics and cleaning those up. We do this yearly, we review them, and I always catch things. And so it's a process, again, by which we're looking at distinct levels. So if we look at what we talked about, good, um, good practice, it is aligned with the standards, we tagged them all. Identify relevant and meaningful attributes, it's research-based, it's standards-based, it's meaningful and relevant. Um, it's observable, every single one of those criteria you will see start with verbs, it's observable in the classroom. It distinguishes the levels of performance, unsatisfactory, developing, proficient, advanced. It aligns across the levels. It's intentionally, it's intentional in that it's aligned to our mission. It's also, it also shows the exit criteria that we have, and it describes the whole. So we have four dimensions, engage, plan, teach, and lead. You will see this for every single dimension. Every single dimension has competencies and indicators and rubrics. Then we built our observation tools. So our observation tools were on the quarter system. So we really looked at what can they realistically do in the fall? What's developmentally appropriate for a novice teacher? Remember, they're teaching in the fall quarter. Okay. Then what is developmentally appropriate for winter? And then the spring has the holistic, every single competency and indicator, the whole thing. So we layer it in so it doesn't overwhelm them or the supervisors as well, and it narrows their focus. So our fall tool will start with some elements of um, engage. You'll see some elements of plan, teach, and lead. Lead is all about professionalism. Okay, that's really where we try to get some students and help them build their skills around being professionals in the field as well and their interactions with others. So then in the second column, what you'll see is feedback and evidence. So that's where we're looking for the indicators. That's where we use some of the evidence from the indicators. We're trying to get them to meet the competency. And then we rate them. But we use this as a formative process. So it's both, 
It's both. It's both a process where it's summative. We get a sum. We sum up to where they are. What's their summative score? Are they developing proficient or advanced? But it's also formative. The very first thing we do is we ask them about their students' progress toward the objective. How do you know your students met your objective? We have every single student post, preview, and review objectives in the classroom. How do you know they met the objective? At the, in the beginning, they just say, I hope they did. I think they did. By the winter quarter, we have them bringing data to us. Show me the data that shows us that your students met the objective. And then we talk about what are their, their own perceived strengths and areas of growth. We talk about their, their um, based on our ratings, their strengths and areas of growth. And then this is where we have interventions to the next level of development, this category here. That's what I learned from INTASK. What do you need to do to develop your skills to the next level? So it may be tell your mentor teacher to count the number of times you are saying this. Tell your mentor teacher to give you feedback on this. Go and observe another teacher who is strong at this. Google formative assessments. Okay. So it, it's an intervention to help them understand how to meet their goals. We set very concrete goals that are simple and measurable. So we do this process, we use this process to move them to the next level. That's what it looked like on the in-task learning progressions. How do we move them to the next level? In your case, it may be a principal. How do you move them to the next level? It may be your counselor. How do you move them to the next level? So that's the performance component. Okay? That's how we really looked at their behaviors in the field. But then we had to go back and look at our curriculum. One of the biggest criticisms in higher education is that our content in the higher education classroom is completely disconnected with the field. So that there is a misconception, sometimes it's actually true, that we teach things in theory that our students will never do in practice. So I can remember and, and being involved in other prep programs where the students would talk about how what we're learning in the classroom I can't do. No, they're telling me to do this. It's not realistic. I can't do this. And so there was a big disconnect. In the go to class and just basically say, well, I'm learning this in theory, but now I'm going to the field and I'll, it's a completely different experience. I'll figure it out. What, what, de what devising this performance assessment did for us is it helped us think backward about then what our curriculum needs to look like. So every single one of our syllabi, we use, we use a standard syllabi template that is backward design. The feet, competencies, and indicators are all in every single one of our syllabi. So we have our curriculum mapped back to the FEAT competencies, as well as our state standards. Okay? But what we're saying is they need to enact these competencies. So for example, in curriculum instruction and assessment, we have all of our students mixed together in curriculum instruction and assessment. That's where they meet these competencies in the classroom as well. So the competencies then drive the curriculum, the readings, the objectives of the courses, um, when I first started developing curriculum, it was, what did I want my students to read? Which authors did I like? Now when I develop curriculum, it's, this is what they need to know and be able to do when they enter the field. That's how I'm going to map back to, my, to, the, to the building the syllabi in the curriculum. So it's tightly, tightly connected. Then we looked at what were some assessments that we could use in the university classroom. This is not all the assessments that we have. But these are our key assessments that we build our electronic portfolios on. The fabric of teaching and learning really gets at the way they view diverse learners. They have to do interviews in the field with students, with community members, with teachers, and find out who their students are and who the community is that they are serving. And they have to write a paper around that um, to really get data that's, that's specific to the data from their community, analyze it, and make some um, recommendations. That one mainly focuses on meeting the needs of ELL students. They also have a classroom and school analysis. Again, data. They bring data where they help to understand the classroom and the school environment. They do unit and lesson planning. We have standard templates that we use, backward design. Right now we're teaching them culturally responsive teaching, how to embed that into unit and lesson planning so that they're building objectives, they're building rationales that are culturally responsive. We have literacy case study, a data analysis and goal setting, a professional belief statement, and a professional development plan. And those are all tagged back again to the feet, our competencies, our dimensions. 
and then they're tagged back to the standards as well. Okay. So the assessments in the university map back and align to the assessments in the field. And that's the glue that we use to hold the curriculum together. I recently had a student in my office saying how, how, how embedded it is, how connected it is. He's a math teacher, secondary math teacher. And he was just amazed that everything he's learning in the classroom, he's able to apply in the field. And so this is something that you rarely hear, right? And our students consistently give us this feedback. So big picture. We started with our mission and vision. We went to the, the institutional mission, our, program, our programmatic mission. We also looked at our personal mission. Okay? That then drove us to look at how do we envision these standards? How do we unpack the standards to create dimensions, competencies, and indicators? Now, how do we create rubrics so we can see different levels of performance? Now, how do we create observation tools so we can make it manageable? We can make it targeted. We can give them good feedback, both summative and formative. And now that we've developed all of these and piloted it, we're in the phase of reliability and validity. Okay, so, um, sorry. We talked about how reliability and validity, I, I had some information on the earlier screens, but um, we went through the development, the pilot, and now uh, we did a study last year working with our research methods and statistics faculty around reliability and validity. And this is what in CAPE is called a transformative initiative. Okay, so, um, I, I know not all of you are, are in teacher education or CAPE, but the process for accreditation gives you three different pathways. One is continuous improvement where you're basically looking at um, how your program has improved over time. The other is an inquiry brief where you make a specific claim and you try to prove it. And the third is something that's, that you feel is transformative for the field, that doing this research and having it available to the field could be transformative. And we took that path in terms of the assessments that we've created to determine their reliability and validity. So we did a study last year which we had all of our supervisors and our students a, a part of the process. We, had, we went out and did extra observations. We had a graduate student doing extra observations. And we worked with our research and statistics and research methods and statistics faculty to look at the reliability of the tool and the validity. Okay, so we did the content validity and the convergent validity. We looked at what do experts in the field say? What's the feedback? And then we looked at how our tool rated with another tool that showed validity. What we found that was our tool had very high validity. In other words, it's measuring what we say it's measuring. It's measuring effective and equitable teaching. But we had low reliability. Our supervisors are not using it reliably in the field when they're rating students. And so what we're seeing is a weakness around training. There was wide variation. We looked at the severity of ratings, and some supervisors were very severe, some were very lenient. We want to be right in the middle. Now, CAPE tells you how to do some of this reliability and validity work that won't take research methods and statistics faculty. Okay, there are simplified ways to look at reliability and validity. And that's something that you could look at to see what's right for your college in terms of how to establish reliability and validity. But basically, if you don't establish the reliability and validity of the assessments, then they have, they're not as powerful, right? If you can establish the validity and reliability, then you know you've got a powerful tool that's targeted. It measures what it's supposed to measure, and people are using it the way that they're supposed to use it. And so that can really help you with your training when you have supervisors out in the field. So even though it can sound daunting to people, there are different ways to establish reliability and validity. And the power there is the feedback that you get for improvement. So the feedback that we got were, was actually that some of our competencies um, were not clear, that we weren't using the, the feedback that we got is that the supervisors weren't really using the competencies in a way or understanding the competencies. So we went back and cleaned up some of the competencies. We went back and took two out that the supervisors were always rating people the same, so they really weren't useful. So we cleaned those up, condensed them, clarified them. So we were able to go back to our competencies. And then we had to also go back and look at our supervisor training and improve that. And that's something that's always a work in progress. So showing video to the supervisors, having them rate, giving them feedback on who was too severe and too lenient, helping them understand that we want to get to the middle, that we want to be consistent. So that really helped us to make adjustments. 
We are doing now a second run at reliability and validity based on the, uh, based on the modifications that we made. And we're, we're looking to um, submit a federal grant to scale it up. So the next thing we want to do is see if our, our performance assessment has predictive validity. Can it predict how they will perform in the field? And so that's our next step is to establish another form. And so really it's about establishing the power, okay? establishing the power. Um, so step back, right? It feels overwhelming when you see the whole thing, but remember that we did it in stages and steps. Okay? The first thing was your mission, institutional mission, okay? programmatic, personal. The second step was then, what do they need to know and be able to do? Let's go to the research base. Let's go to the standards. If you have an existing tool, it may be saying, is this really what they need to know and be able to do? Does that meet the standards? Not just the check off, but do they really meet the standards? Is this what the research is telling us our students need to know and be able to do? Contextualize it to your state as well. What are the needs in our state? What do we need to prepare them for? Then you develop your criteria, your dimensions, competencies, and indicators. Then you develop your rubrics and your observation tools. So if you have something in existence already, I would say, well, what do you have? What do you have that you can build on? Um, what are some short-term and long-term goals that you have in terms of what you already have? Where do you want to shift it? And what do you need to accomplish your goals? So what I'd like for you to do is just turn and talk to the people that are around you and, and talk to them about what do you have in place now? Okay, what, do you, what do you want to change? What do you want to improve? How can you accomplish it? And what do you need? So go ahead and turn and talk, and I'll give you a chance to ask some questions as well. You must believe, but you have to have the data to show it. That's where we're moving, right? We're moving toward... We absolutely believe our students have an impact because we're showing, right, that our students grow over time, that it's research-based, standards-based, that it has strong validity. We're working on the reliability. But the bottom line is, do they really impact kids? Are they really equitable and effective teachers? Do they really impact kids? And so we're building a slew of tools, working again with research methods and statistics surveys, but also looking at doing statistical analysis to follow them into the field. The problem we have right now is we don't have data at the teacher level once they enter the field. And we don't have student level data. And with our state, according to our state representatives, we will not have that. It's, it's in statute. And so what we're having to do is pilot, create a pilot with the Denver Public Schools to get existing data. So we're having to work directly with the districts. And they're not happy about it because every institution wants it. And so there, there's a big issue right now with data in our state. This is the case with many states. Um, with, when I do trainings across the nation, it's a big issue. But I would also challenge um, what are we using as a measure to show effectiveness. If we're only using student test scores, that's not a great indicator of effectiveness because we know there's bias in testing. And that's clearly established in the research. So again, we have to be using multiple measures to look at impact, not just student test scores not just teacher effectiveness data. We have to be looking at different um, potential to show impact. So we're trying to amplify that as well. Great question. And I know I'm out of time. I really appreciate you um, being here. And I hope that you're able to take information and really improve your programs. And again, doing it in a way that really serves your mission, which is focusing on the needs of the underserved. Thank you.